Thank you. Can you all hear me all right? Um, it's great to be here. It really is an honor to be here. Over the years, I've done some workshops and presentations up here in PG, and I've loved it. I've always had a good time. The people are amazing, so it really is an honor to be here. And it's a, an honor to be bringing this message, uh, sharing this message, being a bit of a, a British Columbia-based ambassador of this change, um, this change that's taking place in, in how we think about health and safety generally. So I want to zoom right out here. Is the clicker up here? I want to zoom out on the topic of safety uh, quite a lot um, and, and talk about it in its evolution from the first century uh, to, to this next century, I hope, and this transformation that's taking place. So I'll walk you through it. If I do a decent job of this today, what I want to inspire you to do is, is Google some of these names, uh, go on Amazon, grab a book or something, uh, send me an email, I'm happy to provide you with more information. But I want to tell the story a little bit about a, uh, the journey I've been on, what I've discovered and learned, and, and what I feel passionately about as a, as a new ideology, I guess, or a way to reform safety, um, and, and take it forward. I need to show a few pictures. Um, this is kind of my disclaimer slide to say a little bit about what I'm, what I'm about. I did start in the early 90s as a first aid attendant. Um, had never given safety or first aid much of a consideration before that, um, but took the course and found out I had an affinity for it, and that led to almost 15 years part-time being involved in um, emergency response, ski patrolling, lifeguarding, and, and worked as a paramedic uh, part-time in Princeton, British Columbia, for seven years. So I care very much about uh, uh, caring for injured people, treating those injuries, but a logical extension of that is, is to prevent them, right? So when I began my safety career in the early 90s, there was a very simple cause and effect ratio uh, relationship. Um, keeping people tied off, keeping guardrails up, uh, preventing those injuries, it was very, very immediate. But around 18 to 20 years into my safety profession, my, my career in safety, that started to get a little bit foggy. And I found myself with national accreditations and and um, really like having an excellent career in safety and learning everything I could and doing everything I was supposed to do. I was director of health and safety for a uh, big construction organization. And a few things happened that, uh, that uh, are, are very close to home here in Prince George, but impacted me very deeply. So after a 28 year career, I want to improve safety. I don't mean to be critical of safety, but I just want to give you a bit of a disclaimer story here. So 18 years in, on December 2nd, 2010, was a couple of tragic accidents in, in downtown Vancouver. Uh, two workers were killed within three minutes, within three blocks of one another in Coal Harbor, and it was a, just a devastating morning uh, down in Vancouver, and, to, and it was construction-based. Um, and I knew one of those fellows that was killed that morning. Uh, so that was deeply impactful, and, I, and it really uh, uh, started a, a kind of a professional dissonance where I was wondering what, what are we doing, what works, are we sure we're doing all we can do? And so that started in around 2010, uh, 18 years in, and I sat with that. I was doing my work, I was, we had 2,000 workers almost every day on the bite, on the tools, and I was questioning from a head office perspective, what am I doing? What am I doing to make that better? What am I really doing to make that safer? We were passing audits, we were keeping our injury rate down, but I didn't know that I was having that effect on that work that I wanted to have, that, that I was driven to have. Um, then this happened. And this is not my wheelhouse, I'm down on the coast, but this was a devastating tragedy. And it was so impactful to me um, in my concern for work, worker health and safety, workplace health and safety, that this, this struck me very deeply. Um, I don't know what we missed. It, it, uh, it was something I felt that the, the profession I had many years dedicated to that we, we could have prevented, we, we ought to have prevented, and we didn't. So it was deeply impactful, and it, and it changed the course of my career and, uh, ever since. Um, the month after that, I stepped away from that orthodox safety industry career. I've since let my designations lapse. Um, I took a different tangent after that, uh, professionally. And I didn't know, it was kind of a leap of faith. If I'd done a risk assessment, I probably never would have done it. Uh, but I made a leap, 
on February 29th, 2012, Leap Day, and, and took a new course, a new trajectory in my career. And that's what I want to talk about today. I don't have to tell you, and I say this with great reverence, that two months after I did that, um, this happened. And again, not my town, not my wheelhouse, but it was my profession. And, and this was devastating. This was devastating, and I felt um, that I had to continue this work, and I had to go out and learn and explore and find out what we could find out and bring it back and bring it to bear for the workers of British Columbia. I had to challenge my profession to be better um, and learn, learn new things, bring in some new information. Two years after that, my father-in-law fell 35 feet from a construction site in Bellingham, Washington and landed on his head. Uh, the survival rates for a 35-foot fall are slim. Fred lived. He suffered many, many fractures uh, throughout his body. He suffered about six fractures of his skull, and it was the traumatic brain injury. He was flown to Harborview Medical Center in Seattle. We spent 120 days in intensive care uh, or, or uh, in Harborview Medical Center. So I'd never experienced a workplace accident from this perspective, um, and it's awful. It's absolutely awful. It's long and slow. It's been years. It's, it's painful to them. It's affected family lives, so it's tragic. So I am deeply passionate about, uh, about trying to evolve and, and shed light on, on the subject of safety very generally. So that's what I'm all about. What I didn't know at the time was that in 2012, in Brisbane, Australia, uh, Professor Sidney Decker was coining a term. They were having a meeting and they coined the term safety differently. It is since now it is capitalized, that term is now capitalized, it's trademarked, uh, it's really become something in the last seven years. But at the time, it was simply a discussion from uh, at a university about exploring how we might do safety in workplaces differently. Uh, also in that year in Denmark, a Professor Eric Hallnagel, he's spent 30 years of his, of his career um, uh, trying to learn from large industrial accidents and bring new intelligences and new information to this practice of safety. Um, so there's been a lot changing in the last seven years, uh, and I'm going to try to summarize that for you today. I'm going to speak a little bit about what is uh, and what we've done in safety for the last century, but I'm going to mostly talk about what's emerging right now in real time and what's evolving very, very rapidly. Every month there's new developments in this space. So, one of the more recent terms uh, in this space that really I resonated with is this notion of industrial empathy. Um, you know, we, some scholars will feel that we are in the fourth phase or chapter of the Industrial Revolution. Times have changed very much. You'll see that they were maybe 100-year cycles, and now we're speeding up maybe to a 50-year cycle. But safety as we know it became a thing in between two and three. Round about 1917 was when what we know about safety, the, the building blocks of our current paradigm of safety were created. Uh, and you can see lots has changed, lots has evolved in the world. It's a very different world today. And yet this construct of safety in the workplace has been a little slow to catch up, a little slow to, to evolve and, and uh, uh, adopt new thinking. Um, in 1917 uh, was the birth of workers' compensation. Prior to that, uh, injured workers had to sue to get, to get compensated. They had to prove that the accident was the fault of the employer. And I can, you know, Fred's accident was in the States. The medical bills would be devastating. Um, and to add on top of that, the family's burden if we had to go through a fault exercise um, uh, would have been horrible. So the historic compromise, the birth of workers' compensation insurance is, is a wonderful thing. Um, workers are now, obviously, as you know, workers compensated if they're, if they're hurt in the course of their work. And in exchange for that compensation and, and employers being protected from those lawsuits, we established a set of minimum safety standards, minimum guidelines for the workplace. And that construct, this, this binary construct, uh, was established 102 years ago and has really been instrumental in everything we know about safety to date. Uh, this is really prefaces everything we do. This is not changing. This is not going anywhere. Um, what I want to do is, I, I think we should zoom out 
on this notion of this, this simple binary thing. You know, we, we measure safety in insurance rates and we seek to achieve it through enforcement in one sense or another for the most part. And it's really broadening that perspective that I want to talk about today. So this is eight years into workers' compensation. I'm not sure if you can read that from where you are. This is a notice that went out. From this date forward, any employee who has three accidents in one year that put them under the doctor's care will be considered a careless workman and fired, unless you can, he can furnish positive proof that the accident was unavoidable. But all accidents must be reported. Please help us keep down accidents. Um, I, this is a logical extension when we're measuring in claims, when we see workers as a problem to be controlled, when we simplify the cause of accidents and we see it as being workers' fault. I wish this was a hundred-year-old notion. Uh, I'm sad to say, I'm afraid to say, this notion is, is not too far off our tables. I've heard uh, in recent years uh, statements to this effect where uh, employers kind of wish we could, we could do this sort of thing. Uh, and that was eight years into workers' compensation. Uh, kind of an unintended consequence, kind of a side effect of what we're trying to do. In 1931, we had our first safety science ever. And Herbert William Heinrich uh, did some studies and, and uh, uh, created some, some safety laws that really affected the, how we achieve safety ever since. Uh, I should say that Heinrich was uh, with an insurance company. Heinrich was an investigator for the Travelers Insurance Company in the United States. And so he did all of his research by looking at claims files, by closed claims files and reports on those claims. He didn't do any active investigation or, or any digging to find out what went on. So this is one of his rules, this pie chart. Um, it was, we refer to it as the 88, 10, and 2 ratio. Heinrich told us that the darkest bit, the 2%, unavoidable. Absolutely unavoidable accidents. You'll never do anything to prevent those. The other piece, 10%, that's mechanical failure. Something breaks, a weld breaks, something fails. But the big piece of the pie, 88% of the time, worker's fault. That's what he said, a human-caused worker fault. Now this, uh, in 1931, was really in keeping with the thinking of the time. Uh, science was looking at accident proneness, they were looking at ancestry, um, they were thinking that some people are more suited to some things than others, uh, but this notion that it was the mental, physical, and moral shortcomings of the worker that caused accidents was very prevalent of the time. So there was this very top-down, judgy kind of thing built in. Old habits die hard. Um, to this day, it's difficult for us to shake this idea that whenever an accident happens, it's somebody's fault and that somebody has to pay the price for that. So this was one of Heinrich's first, uh, first rules. The other one that he's quite famous for is this triangle or pyramid. And these were his ratios of the day, one major, 29 minors. He assumed a bunch of no-injury accidents. As, an as a workers' comp insurance provider, he wouldn't have had data on those no-injury uh, no claims, and he assumed the bottom piece. But it, what he did about this, we'll all have ratios between our minors and our majors, but what he told us in 1931 was that minors are foundational. He called this diagram the foundation of a major accident. So what he was basically saying was, you, wor you worry about the small stuff, the easy stuff and the big stuff will take care of itself. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. Our ratios have changed over the years. Our pyramids are much taller and much skinnier than this. So our numbers have changed. But the causation, when we unpack what causes those minors and those first aids and medical aids, it, they're not the same mechanisms that cause majors. The stuff that sprains your ankle or causes you to throw your low back out is not likely to kill you. It's not likely to cause those catastrophes. So we'll still try to manage our claims costs. We care about ankles and backs, but we can't believe that the pursuit of, 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 of going after those, those ankle problems and those back problems, we have to know that that's fundamentally different than preventing the major stuff. There are two different methodologies going on there, two different causations. So this pyramid though, again, we still see that to this day. Uh, we, I see companies that go after uh, minor injury causation as though it's the, the, end, of, the end of everything and, and just spending so many resources on minor, minor things. Um, 
thinking, I believe, that uh, they're, they're tackling this problem of safety and that they're prevented. Unfortunately, you know, the, the, the one example that's used quite a lot is the Deepwater Horizon. They had reduced hand injuries, they were winning safety awards for their ability to reduce hand injuries, finger injuries, um, and then they suffered their catastrophic accident. So they're two different things. These are two different battles to fight. Uh, and Heinrich kind of, his work did a lot of good for us. It advanced safety science for its day, but we're 90 years past that. There's a lot more information on the table in this fourth industrial revolution we should look at. This is a graph out of the United Kingdom, but it's, it's similar, it's common to jurisdictions around the world. And what it says is over the last however many years, there's been three distinct efforts in health and safety that have gotten us this successful. We are as successful as we've ever been. We're safer than we've ever been. And we've gotten there through these three marked advancements over the years. Engineering, education, and enforcement. So my career has taken place just in that last bit. Um, so it's external enforcement, it's the criminal code, but it's also the era of safety management systems and internal enforcement. So it's in this era that uh, you don't need a regulator or uh, the criminal justice system to kick in. If we're not processing our toolbox talks or our hazard assessments or whatever it is, um, you know, there's some internal consequences for that. So we run safety management systems now, uh, and it's really uh, responsible for a huge amount of success. And we're down at that low point right now. One of the issues we're finding is that many organizations in different industry sectors in different countries of the world can do this. They can get down to that level and they get stuck. We call it an asymptotic state or, that, or a plateau. And you can get down to a certain point and then you find your numbers stop improving uh, and you get stuck there. So faced with that challenge, uh, lots of people do lots of different things. Some will try what's worked in the past only harder. Uh, others will shift it up a bit and come at it anew, but they're really not trying anything new or different to improve that line on the graph. And the other uh, tragic thing that happens when our results are so successful, but our line on the graph plateaus, is we think we're doing really very well for safety, and then something catastrophic happens. And I go back to the previous slide, that we can manage those numbers, we can manage our insurance cost numbers, um, but we somehow become detached from those large and critical risks. And that's why um, otherwise safety award-winning organizations can suffer serious and catastrophic accident because they're winning awards based on this low claims rate, not on, their, uh, not on the effectiveness of risk management or managing critical risks in the workplace. So our current doctrine in, this, in our safety industry, this construct of safety in, in industry, um, a, safety is the absence of injuries. Now, of course, that's true on some basic level. But as we've just said, you know, simply being able to reduce those injuries or the metrics of those injuries down to a, to a low level is not necessarily the same as being safe every shift. Uh, it's not difficult to go to organizations that I visit and, and ask people in operations. So you've had a great month, you've sent very few people to first aid, nobody went to medical aid last month, that's great. Were you managing safety well every day in that month? And they'll say, hmm, maybe, you know? Um, it's a proxy measurement, and we assume that low numbers in a one proxy measurement mean the presence of something else, and that's just not so. Um, workers being a problem to control, it's so easy to slip into this mindset. Um, going all the way back to Taylor in 1911 and Vernon in 1913 and Heinrich in 1930 and even the behaviorist psychology movement around the 50s and around the 1950s we learned a lot about behaviorism and we thought it's just those worker behaviors that are the problem so we'll incentivize good behaviors, we'll punish bad behaviors and that'll solve our safety problem. So psychology has evolved a lot since 1950 um, and we need to take that now in 2019, we need to take some of those new learnings on board and consider them in our places of work. Um, last, safety has become a bureaucratic accountability. The consequences that employers face when they have an accident is such that this, this notion of internalizing due diligence uh, creates this paper chase and we, we defend ourselves with documents and papers so that we marginalize the causal sphere of an accident down to something very local. It's not the organization, it's not the division, 
it's those couple of guys, or, or whatever it is. So it's become very much a, a bureaucratic game. And I, I relate to these very much. In 2012, uh, before I departed conventional safety, I have to confess, uh, 20 years into my profession, and I think I was, I was, I believed in this doctrine. Um, if I had to look back on my first 20 years, I don't even know that I was in the safety business. I think I was in the unsafety business because my phone didn't ring to tell me everything was going great. Um, my phone rang in the safety department when something horrible happened. I didn't go out and study excellence, I studied accidents. Um, we investigated, we put patches on, we tried to shore up our system. We were doing everything that everybody else does, and logically so. But this was kind of that, the confines, that kind of doctrine box that I was in, that when those events happened in, in and around 2012, I felt there has to be something outside this box uh, that, we'll bring, that we can bring back in and we can do better. Um, you know, when somebody, a fellow I work with in this space, he, he uses the phrase, he says, you know, we don't learn about good marriage by only studying divorce. How do we think we can learn about safe work by only studying accidents? It's a little close to home for me because I've had a few of those, but uh, it, that's an example of, of this thinking we're talking about. There's some unintended consequences. As successful as we are at keeping people safe, historic lows, um, there's some unintended consequences. And it's because our system is so dominated by insurance and enforcement, this uh, insurance, workers' comp insurance and, and safety rule enforcement. There's some unintended consequences. When we pursue low claims costs, and that's our metric, when those low numbers are what we go for, um, it separates us from high risk and the catastrophic risk because we're worried about how people open cans of beans in the lunchroom and cut their fingers and require stitches, um, which is not obviously a catastrophic risk. Um, that, that Insurance rates are important. A lot of us pre-qualify for work on our insurance rates, so they're critical, but they're seen as a measure of safety. Low numbers mean you're safe. And it's just not accurate. So pursuit of insurance cost alone separates us from high risk. I work with an organization that bonuses their managers on keeping those rates low. So if that manager has an employee who requires a doctor's care for something, that fellow's in this bind to say, well, I can get my yearly bonus this year, or I can uh, you know, let this guy go and get an MRI or get good care for his injury. It puts people in untenable situations because we may withhold the care that, that somebody deserves to be healthy. Not every claims metric is, a, is indication of an absence of safety. I believe employers can, can care for their people and, and ask them to go to the doctor and get checked out, and that's good HR, that's, that's good humanity. Uh, and so there'll be a number on your claim stats, but that was triggered by the company. That's not triggered due to a lack of safety. So we need to really think about that. People become a stat. Uh, the same organization will go out at a stand down with 100 workers in the room and say things to the workforce like, we need uh, you know, our recordable incident frequency to go down by 0.2 next quarter. And I think, you know, if I'm in that crowd, if I'm on the tools every day, putting myself in the bite, um, uh, working hard, trying not to get injured, that's not point two. That's somebody's back, it's somebody's, it's somebody's finger or hand. Um, when we take statistics out to people with literal skin in the game, I think we're really divulging that we care about the numbers, not that skin and not that nerve endings. I'm not saying everybody does this, but uh, there are, this happens. I've seen this happen. When we pursue enforcement in the name of uh, achieving safety, um, the pursuit of compliance alone, we, we separate from complex risk. Minimum safety standards for the last hundred years have been a wonderful thing for the workplace. Heights of guardrail, fall protection, there's lots of great stuff we get from regulation and enforcement. But it's very difficult in this complex world of work to write a regulation for everything. And so we, we, we t bend and shift and change uh, regulatory enforcement. What we now know is that when something creeps up and affects a workplace, when something seriously harms a worker, it's quite often um, due to a complex set of, of very subtle things. It's not often one non-compliance. It's not often one rule that was not complied with that caused it. Now we can come in after the fact and apply rules to it, 
uh, we're kind of obligated to do that. But it doesn't mean that it was precisely those things that caused it. Most serious and fatal accidents we look at these days are actually the result of a lot of small, simple, quiet warning signs uh, that, we, that we blow past for a variety of reasons. So I feel that enforcement alone separates us from the complexity of causation and the complexity of risk. Uh, we try to enforce so hard that um, safety itself, getting caught, becomes a hazard that the workforce has to deal with. Um, some organizations uh, are quick to judge and quick to blame. And so that really suppresses our ability to hear those weak signals and hear those stories from the coalface that would be indicators that we need to look at our system. Um, the hazard of safety discipline has a really quelling, quieting effect at a time when we need to be listening closely and hearing stories of the work uh, the hazard of safety discipline actually suppresses our ability to hear those stories. And last, this judge and blame game. It is so prevalent and it's just absolutely uh, quashing. You can, you know, the McAtee review that took place in this province a few years ago. Uh, Gord McAtee actually said one thing in that report. He's one thing that really stands out to me. He said a lot of things. But what stood out to me was he said, you know, you can, you can seek to learn or you can seek to punish, but you cannot do both. And interestingly enough, that statement, that idea, is one that's front and center in this new ideology, in this new movement. But we have to choose. When you investigate, there's a difference between investigation and learning, really fully learning what went on. Because when I investigate, I'll get a version of the truth, but I'll get a kind of a defensive constructed version of the truth. It's not the same as the wide open, super honest version of the truth. Uh, and we have an atrophy of vigilance. The, uh, being successful as we've ever been in history means there's no need, people don't feel a need to change. People don't feel a need to improve. And yet I think because of that asymptotic state and the risk we put our people under, I think there absolutely is. Our system, as effective as it is, uh, there's some blind spots. It gives us, there's some things we can't see and detect based on our system. On the insurance side, we have no fault insurance and that's a good thing. Nobody, we didn't have to prove that Fred's accident was not his fault. We didn't have to prove it was the company's fault. There was no fault insurance. The consequence of that is that when you call, the, the, our best source of data in the province is WorkSafe BC claims, and when people call to make a claim, they can't inquire as to fault. Um, so what they'll do is they'll say, what did you do? I'm Jeff, I fell eight feet off a ladder onto, onto concrete on my right side. And that's the data that we can collect. So what we end up with is objects, ladder, and mechanism, fall, falls from ladders, or struck by mobile equipment. And this is still good data. It's gotten us this far. It's close enough to cause that there's things we can go and do about that. But it's not cause. It doesn't say why I fell off that ladder. It doesn't say why that worker was struck by that mobile equipment when there's people proximal to mobile equipment every day. So it's gotten us this far. But I don't know that it's enough to take us into the next century or to achieve the results that we're expected to achieve. So what we end up doing because of that is it's a, quite a primary safety strategy these days to take away tools and prescribe more and more PPE on people. We're famously taking away razor knives and crescent wrenches and ladders and we're making people wear more and more and more PPE every day whether they face those risks or not. And it might seem like an adequate safety strategy but there's some problems with that psychologically. Psychologically we're saying to mature, responsible, professional grown-ups that you can't be trusted with that razor knife or that crescent wrench. And w by prescribing more and more PPE, rather than make people alert to risk and risk adept and aware, um, we know it has the effect of making people feel 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I'm all padded up, I'm all protected, right? I go to work and it actually dulls our sense of risk, right? So that later at home on the weekend when somebody's doing yard work, there's nobody there to enforce the safety glass rule true story and a fellow I work with took a branch to the eye when he was trimming the hedges and the boss was like why we make them wear safety glasses all week at work why doesn't he wear them at home well he's wearing them at work because you make him wear them at work and he'll get in trouble if he doesn't he's not wearing them at work because he notices a risk to his eyes and he takes action that would be better harder but better 
Um, simple, easy metrics. The other blind spot is that these simple, calculable numbers that come from the insurance system distract us and seduce us into thinking that uh, good scores there mean we're safe. The other blind spots that come from the enforcement side of our view, um, generally, we investigate and we say what didn't happen. This, pr this precaution wasn't taken, this, this wasn't done, this wasn't done. That's not the same as learning what did happen and why it happened. That's what we're supposed to do in investigation, remember? We're supposed to understand why something happens, but we tend in an enforcement view to uh, insert blame and judgment in it right away by just saying what didn't happen. We use counterfactual reasoning to get there. Um, we tend to see through a regulatory rule lens, not a, not a truly operational lens that respects the context of the workplace. So what we end up doing on the enforcement side as a safety strategy is just continue to layer on more rules and more policies and constrain and limit people. And quite often we do that without real consultation with those that do the work. Not everybody, but, but many. And we use punishment to improve. We use this, re um, this uh, seeking retribution. It's been inherent in our system because that's what an external regulator, whether it's the federal's uh, ESDC on the federal side or WorkSafe or any provincial regulator, they, they're external to the organization and so they use uh, penalty and sanction to motivate compliance. And what we've done over the years is just internalize that. We go, well, that's how safety is done, right? It's measured in claims, it's achieved through enforcement, that's what we're going to do in our company. And there's no mandate to do that. There's no regulation on the books anywhere that says companies must seek uh, discipline or retribution uh, internally to their workforce. We do it for due diligence, perhaps, when we have somebody who's non-complying, 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 yes, we should up the consequences of that through discipline. But quite often it's become the first thing we go to. We don't investigate and then look at the data and see if there's culpability there. We go in guns ablazing for culpability right off the hop. And that has a real quelling effect on our relationship with the workforce when we need them the most. So I'm going to talk about the new view, and I think something important, this just came out last summer. Uh, the steelworkers uh, of Pittsburgh in America, the steelworkers in Toronto, Canada, and a union in the UK called Unite, they all published this paper on this, what we call the new view of safety. This is really important, and it's really exciting to me that three or two major unions in three major nations have co-authored this paper saying, look, this new view stuff, um, we support it. We want to explore it. We want to encourage its exploration. So that's really interesting. That's really very interesting to me. Still only half the equation. The other thing that's going on in the world today is that major international players, G&E, Maersk Shipping, uh, ConocoPhillips, uh, many, many large players in industry are also uh, working with the same people that are quoted in this paper. Uh, they're adopting the same principles. So where conventionally over the century we've seen a bit of a, a labor relations divide and we've seen safety almost weaponized in some workplaces, um, we're starting to see a path forward that bridges over that. And when we, we have both sides of that equation coming to the table, very exciting times. And we're doing work right now in British Columbia uh, based on this paper and it's, it's really bearing fruit in industries that conventionally didn't do so well. So I want to start talking about some of these gurus now and quickly move through this. Um, but I have to mention Eric Hallnagel first. Eric's been doing this a very long time uh, out of Denmark. And he's a fella that starts by having us question our very definition of safety. Um, given the root word, the, the origins of the word safety, of course it means as few things as possible going wrong. And it's that approach that's gotten us as far as we've gotten. Eric would say, these days, we need to change our definition. We need to add another definition. It's also when as many things as possible go right, right? We have a different problem to manage. And to further extend that principle, we talk about resilience now, or the adaptive capacity of, of people at work. The ability to adapt and succeed in a piece of work under varying and challenging circumstances. That's a measure of our safety, our agility, our adaptability, our ability to get through a tough, potentially hazardous piece of work successfully in all kinds of weather conditions and other conditions. That is a, a, an excellent measure of safety in the 21st century. He's, our, our success rate means that our serious and fatal incident rate is a very small slice of the pie. Eric would say that 
by only looking at those things that go wrong, um, it doesn't have a great predictive value. It's a narrow slice of the pie, and when we look at it after the fact, we, um, we, we have a lot of biases that we put on it. So he says, only looking at that red slice of the pie doesn't help us a great deal. Con on the contrary, if we learn to appreciate the green, um, that has high predictive value. That improves our performance. That meets the safety two definition of safety by ensuring we're adaptable and we have capacity and as many things as possible go right. He depicts it this way, which I think is pretty good. Historically, going back 100 years, that first beaker had a lot of bad stuff in it. And we've used our tools and tactics to reduce that bad stuff down to trace amounts. But uh, once you now only have trace amounts in your jar, the same tools and techniques you use to get there, they might not be super effective at cleaning up that last little bit. We might have to change strategy now because we're almost, our success has almost caused a new problem. So he flips. In the new view, he depicts it that way. And I resonate with this. In my 20-year in my career, conventional safety career, I was on this side. I only saw the bad stuff. I had no idea why our company was as successful as it was, how our crews were able to come through tough situations and do excellent pieces of work. If I had to do it over again, um, I would study that because that's what we wanted. I was obsessed with what we didn't want. Remember the marriage and divorce thing? Um, I was studying what we didn't want, thinking we could fix it. And that's still something we'll always do. But to add to that an appreciation for what goes right and to amplify and magnify what goes right that's a good strategy. Not only does it improve our safety, it improves our operations. And it has us talking to our people. And it has us learning about our operations and appreciating the expertise we have on board. I'm afraid that a conventional approach to safety doesn't always allow us to learn as much as we possibly can from our experts out in the field. So remember I said there was those three E words, engineering, education, and enforcement. Scott Geller is, an, is the uh, like American guru on, on safety and human behavior and things like that out of Virginia Tech University. He says we need three new E-words. We're not going to stop doing conventional safety. We're not going to stop using these three E-words. But we need to add new E-words. And he says they are emotion and empathy and empowerment. How's that? How's that sound in a safety conversation? I know seven years ago, I would have to put this slide up and do a lot of backpedaling and explaining. It's not that bizarre concept anymore. We're driven by emotion. We're an emotional species. Um, we're driven by what feels good and what we like and dislike and, and people we like to work with and don't. We're an emotional species. We just can't deny it. But and then again, I worked in the day and age when they said, if you don't work, want your feelings hurt, leave them at the gate, right? That's what we used to say. Uh, empathy is not sympathy. It's simply really understanding what it's like for our people at the, co at the coal face where the rubber meets the road and listening to them. And empowerment. In a day and age when we have engagement issues, uh, not much of what we do is empowering. And we know that an individual, a professional, when they're empowered over some control over their surroundings, we know they're engaged. So we come right at this engagement problem. We don't think to use empowerment as a means to get there necessarily. So Scott Geller gives us these three new E words. This is Professor Sidney Decker out of Australia. And he's done a lot of work. He's got the Safety Differently brand. Um, so he'll go back on those, those three principles of, of doctrine. He'll say, safety is not the absence of injuries. Just like uh, similar to Eric Hallnagel, he says, safety is the presence of resilience and positive capacities. Right? It's our skill. It's our ability to go and tackle a piece of work. He says that people aren't a problem to be controlled. People are a solution to harness. It's been so simple over 100 years just to see people's variation and judge them in hindsight. You know what? It's those same people that are responsible for so much of our success in difficult situations. People aren't a problem. People are the thing that helps us succeed most of the time, a vast majority of the time. And this bureaucratic accountability of, of defending and due diligence, uh, safety is an ethical responsibility. Organizations I've worked with that have an accident, they're judged as a whole. Uh, they can sit and start throwing stones internally all they want uh, and defending and, and um, saying, well, this is on them because I've got a paper that says he knew better. Um, but really, that doesn't help us recover as an organization. It doesn't help us culturally as an organization. Sid's done a lot of work in just culture. He too, a number of these fellows say the same thing Gord McAtee said right here in BC, you can't learn and punish at the same time. 
You can either blame and, pub and punish or learn and improve, but you can't do both. Um, so these are all of his books. He talks about retributive justice and, and how much in health and safety we do seek to blame and, and lay consequence on people. Uh, and there's a time and a place for that when people are negligent, when people are malicious, when, uh, when there's, you know, that malicious rule breaking. Absolutely, absolutely. But we tend in safety to cast a wide net on that. And even when it's a simple human error piece, we tend to still think we can punish our way to success. So this notion of seeking retribution, or as Sid says, meeting pain with pain. Somebody's been hurt and we're gonna come and we're gonna inflict more, more harm to try to get ourselves there. Sid speaks of restorative justice within our cultures. When something happens and it was unintended, um, we, we could better ask, Who's been hurt? How can we heal? What can we do? We should meet pain with healing and recovery. Uh, and we don't in health and safety, I'm afraid. Not, not as a rule. Sid did a lot of studies in hospitals in the UK. And one in 12 hospital admissions results in a medication error. Not always something major, but one in 12 uh, passes through a hospital results in something unintended happening. And when they really investigated those, they found there was workarounds and shortcuts and violations and errors. They found all that stuff in those hospital admissions that didn't go well. So being the good researchers they are, they looked at the other 11 hospital admissions that went really well. You go in, you get diagnosed, you get treated, you leave, and it's a great story. When they looked at those, you can't believe the difference. This is what they found. Same. These things happen in everyday work. There's variation and there's imperfection every day. So we have to be really careful when we come out, when we, when we only look at the things that go wrong and we see one of these things, of course we just, we make an attribution and we say that's the cause. But how causative is it really if it's also there during uneventful days? Because people are working in an imperfect system. We're not saying that errors and violations and those things are all right. We're just saying that they don't only exist in failure. They exist far more regularly than we would think, and we should take that under advisement. He's, uh, here's Todd, Todd Conklin, and, and this is what I want to end on, is these five principles of human and organizational performance. It's Todd's work that the steelworkers are advocating. It's Todd's work right now that's being adopted by these major international organizations to improve safety. So the path forward, I think, lies in a consideration of these principles. This is a book that just came out a few months ago. Todd's first principle, error is normal. We're fallible. Even our best people make mistakes sometimes. So we're not gonna run perfect systems with perfect people. Error happens, and we have to deal with that. Um, two, blame fixes nothing. If somebody suffers an, an, an unintended uh, thing uh, and then you go and blame them for it as though they didn't intend to do it today, if we blame them, they're not going to do something they didn't intend to do tomorrow. I don't know, it gets messy. But uh, it, it's, error is not the same as negligence or violation. If it's negligence or violation, there's going to be some retribution, that's fair. But when we really look at what happens and we really unpack it without judgment, we may find that human error plays a bit of a role. We may find that blame then fixes nothing. Here's that point again. Learning and improving is vital. The fourth principle. Unlike the behavioral psychologists where we just focus right on people's behavior, um, we now understand that people's behavior doesn't happen in a vacuum. Our behavior happens in context, in the context of the work and the conditions and the equipment and the coworkers, right? Behavioral psychology was like Pavlov's dog and B.F. Skinner's pigeons, and he would train them, mice in a maze, that kind of thing. We're not that. Our, when we're at work as professionals, we're not mice in a maze. Um, we need to understand that the context we create quite often drives human behavior. And last, our response to failure matters. How we organizationally choose to respond to failure is a huge determining factor on our ability to learn, our ability to hear, the amount of trust, the amount of empathy that we utilize within our organization. So just to unpack these a little bit, this normal error thing, uh, we all have mental slips and lapses. We all make mistakes. If I make a mistake, it's I screw up something like this or I screw up my slide deck or I don't press collate on a photocopier, right? But there's some other people out there in a bite and if they make a mistake, there's some consequences. Uh, mistake, that's why we call them honest mistakes. It wasn't intended. They believed something was true and it wasn't true. 
Uh, error is not the opposite of success. Error exists even in successes. There's lots we can say about this. If we're running our systems so close to the edge that we require fallible human beings to be perfect every shift, we might be running it a little too close to the line. We should, be, we should uh, know where error is possible, we should know where error is critical, and we can build in defenses around that. But uh, a, simple, a simple lapse shouldn't have catastrophic consequences. Blame fixes nothing. This is interesting. People achieve high levels of performance and engagement based on encouragement and reinforcement. And blame is the absolute opposite of that. So we have to be mindful of these unintended consequences we create when we seek to judge and solve uh, you know, our safety problems through blame. Uh, blame is emotionally important. As people, it makes us feel good to find a culprit, to build a case against the culprit, to punish them. <sighs> We're good. We're back to safety. Um, it's emotionally important. It's not operationally important. And there's many stories in, uh, from many industries. The one that stands out is, a, is a, again, from a hospital system in the UK where a nurse made a medication error and uh, they had a long system of just culture and reporting their challenges and reporting their errors. And so a nurse made an error and something bad happened on the night shift and she came in the next day and said, ah, oh, well, I think I mixed, I, uh, I mixed those medications. Um, you know, the computer was down, it was handwritten. Uh, I might have mixed up incorrect medications and she did what everybody else was doing. She reported that error. Um, although because of the consequences, she was fired and then later arrested and she went through the court system and she was held to blame for that error, that simple mistake because it wasn't printed out, it was handwritten. Um, what do you think happened in that hospital system when it came to nurses admitting and discussing and learning from their challenges and their errors? Did that hospital become a safer place for your family members to go after that happened? Because it's just a matter of time before another nurse comes along, maybe with some fatigue, maybe with two medication bottles that look almost identical except for the concentration, right? And, and we suffer another human error. So that, that hospital system was very brilliant, or brittle, sorry, and couldn't tolerate, there was catastrophic consequences from one human error. And the, the system didn't get any more resilient as a result of, of blaming that person and not looking at the underlying system. So there's lots we can say there about blame. Learning and improving. We know the world is changing so fast in 2019, we're either actively seeking to learn or we're losing to somebody else who is. And you know, this principle, this is not a passive principle. We'd all say we like to learn from our operations. This is a commitment. Um, the, the other piece that comes once we talk about this principle is, is the, old, uh, the old line from the movie, can you handle the truth, right? Can you handle the truth? If you want to know the messy reality of what happens in our operations, you need to be able to hear that truth. I guess it's like asking your teens to be super honest with you. Do you really want that? Um, you got to be able to handle that truth. But it's important if you can, because that's going to be the path forward to improvement. Uh, this is the whole learn and improve or, or, or blame and, and punish. Um, we know when we go out to organizations that they don't need external people. Sometimes you need a bit, of a, a bit of a shepherd in the early days or a bit of a facilitator. But every organization we go into has all of the expertise, all of the knowledge, all of the brilliance it could ever need. And it has it under its roof now. You've got so many experienced and wonderful people out there, but our current systems don't always allow us to tap into that and really appreciate that wealth of knowledge. It seems kind of weird when you state it that way, but it's true. Um, we don't seek to have operational learning, operational intelligence as much as we can. We've got a lot of experts on board. We just need to come at them in a very real way. Workers are the experts, profound users of our work processes. Context drives behavior. Uh, we know very much now that uh, uh, we'll, we'll choose to seek local sources of causation. You know, we don't, this notion of shift work and changing shift works, going back to Mike's piece, uh, that's not easy to change. That can be, you know, the, the fatigue in that shift work could really be one of the work contexts that, that creates things happening, but are we really gonna go there? Are we truly prepared to go there and, and, and upset something that's really fundamental to particular industries or particular occupations? 
So we have to handle the truth that says that a lot of human behavior is driven by the context we create. But are we ready to handle that truth? Um, yeah, amazing there. And last, how we respond to failure matters. I love this quote. Between a stimulus, a trigger, and, and our response, there's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Quite often in this busy world, especially at work, uh, me as a, as a safety guy, somebody comes along and, and reports an accident or something bad or a mistake, and I'm just like, right? You just go immediately to a kind of a reaction. You know the thing about a reaction is it's automatic. There's no thinking in it. I think that we're supposed to be people of action. We're supposed to contemplate and, and really think deeply and take action, not just react, not just be triggered and react any way that, any way that comes up. And this is why this Viktor Frankl quote, I think, is really important. There's a, there's a moment, there's a moment between the trigger and what we choose to do about it. And in that moment lies our ability to succeed and improve and grow and go forward. So these beliefs, these five principles are really kind of broad-based beliefs. They don't fundamentally change our safety management systems. They change how we operate within our safety management systems. They change how we think about the world of work. And, and honestly, reading this, it's a simple read, this book. It's a profound read, and I highly recommend it. It'll affect what you think and how you dice and slice incidents. And I think it'll really greatly increase our ability to grow and learn and improve. Because if we don't, we're doing the same stuff we've always done and expecting a different result. And we know we're not supposed to do that, right? Isn't that Einstein? I love this. A culture, this is, this is very profound, a culture can only be as safe as the leader's ability to hear bad news. Our work cultures can only be as safe as our ability to hear bad news, a failure, an accident, a mistake. We have to hear those things and we have to respond mindfully, not just react to them. So these five principles, they are loaded. There is a lot of amazing stuff in these five principles and I think they really are a culmination of the last 40 years of work that's come out of psychology and sociology uh, and again, safety one and safety two coexist. We're not asking anybody to take off any of their armor, any of their protections that our organizations have for health and safety. We're just learning a new martial art, maybe, to really abuse that metaphor. So going back to Heinrich's 88, 10, and 2 principle. In 1931, it made perfect sense. We've come a long way. If we look at it again, we have new understandings about that 88%. So that big piece of the pie now, we can further divide it. 25% of that 88%, we might attribute to just person stuff. Truly just humans being humans and being fallible. But this other big piece, what, we, what new studies have shown, because context drives behavior, is that fully 75% of that 88% is system-induced system-induced human error because we're rushing, because we're fatigued, because there's imperfect systems of tools and information and equipment and crews. So we realize now that there, there, we used to just think, well, 88% human error, nothing you can do about that except blame. It's not true. On the human side, and I thought Mike's piece was excellent, there, for instance, to look at that fatigue, there are some aspects of, of human fatigue that are very much in that person's own in their agency, in their, in their own ability, how they live their lives. That employer, the employment relationship is gonna be hard to touch. But then there's other factors that we really can affect. Just on the topic of fatigue alone, there are system-induced factors affecting that fatigue. So this topic of fatigue really straddles that line down there at, at five o'clock. And some of it's personal and some of it's not. But this opens up tons of potential and possibility. We can't just throw our hands in the air and say, well, it's those darn behaviors. There's, there's room for improvement based on this new science. There's ways we can improve our odds and seek to understand and support our people far better than we ever have in health and safety. So last slide, I get 10 minutes for some questions here maybe, or we can finish ahead of time. It's a sunny Friday after all. But uh, this, is, uh, this is why I use this, this logo. These are the three primary colors of light. And I have to tell you, I spent 20 years of my career above the black line. I spent 20 years of my career seeing my profession of health and safety as being one largely having to do with enforcement and compliance and regulation. 
And I fall into that doctrine, people is a problem, safety is a bureaucratic exercise, safe means the absence of injuries, and we know there's a bunch of stuff we can say about that now. By zooming out on this topic, we now see people and systems. I, and I think about the game of hockey. You know, a team plays good hockey because the coach knows his people, he knows a lot of strategy about the game, we know some systems of the game of hockey. We hit the ice trying to play good hockey based on people and systems, not just the rules of the game. The rules of the game are important. They'll penalize you and hold you back, but that's kind of the way to keep tabs. You don't ever field a good hockey team by only looking at the rule book for the game of hockey. And you don't only ask the referees how to play good hockey. Coaches know that to field a really excellent hockey team that's going to win games, we need to know our people and we need to support our athletes and really understand them and support them and we need to make sure our people mesh with our systems of the game so we put the right people in the right positions and on the right lines. That's how we play good hockey. And if I had to do it over again, I wish I had this insight however many years ago because honestly, 20 years above that line thinking I could police my way to the promised land. And now I realize we have to serve and support the excellence that's already there in our systems, the, uh, the intelligence that's already there in our people. And we need to not judge them. We need to look at the, truly look at the context in which they work and seek to understand that. It's through that industrial empathy. Uh, it's through that understanding and appreciation of what goes right and amplifying what goes right. That is our path forward. So, that's changed my life. Um, I don't know that I'm going to change yours uh, in this hour. I do, if any of this has been intriguing in any way, I do urge you, thanks to the power of the internet these days, look these guys up, you can read these books, send me an email, I'll fill your inbox with resources and videos and papers and articles and anything else under the sun. But there's a whole wealth of knowledge out there in this space. And I just wanted to take, I'm grateful for this opportunity to stand before you and say, you know, uh, it's the 21st century and we've been stuck inside a box for a long time and there's a whole beautiful world outside that box and uh, I hope you're interested and I hope you uh, do what I did and, and start learning about this and seeking ways to improve it. I tell you, it's great. Hop in the pool, the water's fine. Uh, it's awesome. So that's it. That's what I have for you today. Um, Thank you.